Included in President Nixon's budget message today was a provision to cut another $217 million from the space program. This will not, however, affect plans to follow uh, Sunday's Apollo 14 launch with three more missions to the moon. We are now less than 48 hours away from Sunday's blastoff, and Walter Cronkite, who's at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, has a progress report. Perfects, the word being used out here, describe everything so far about Apollo 14. The countdown so far has been flawless. The astronauts' health is fine. The outlook for launch day weather on Sunday is equally good. And all goes well out there on Fad 39. Still in its service structure, the Saturn V rocket, which is the liftoff at 3.23 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Sunday. The crew for this flight, Mission Commander, Navy Captain Alan Shepard, 47, from East Derry, New Hampshire. Father of two, one a married daughter whose Army Lieutenant husband is in Vietnam. Ten years ago, Shepard was America's first space hero. He took our first tentative step into space, 115 miles up, 300 miles downrange. Since then, grounded by ear trouble, this is the comeback of the oldest man in the astronaut corps. Shepard's tough, competent, a superb physical specimen, and thoroughly trained. But this is the least experienced crew ever to take an Apollo spaceship into the skies. Never before has one gone aloft without a veteran of the two-man long-distance Gemini flights in command. And Shepard's two crew members have never flown before. They are Edgar Mitchell, 40, hometown Artesia, New Mexico, a doctor of science and astronautics, Navy commander, father of two daughters. He'll walk the moon's surface with Shepard. Stuart Rosa, 37, Air Force Major, Tucson, Arizona, one-time forest fire smoke jumper, four children. He'll circle the moon, waiting the moonwalker's return. These men are destined for the most interesting terrain man has yet visited on the moon, the rugged Frau Morrow area of the so-called Sea of Rains, a vast 700-mile-wide crater formed by impact probably with another moon in the first days of our universe. And scientists believe the rocks they bring back from there may prove to be from that time, five and a half billion years ago, far older than any rocks brought back by Apollo 11 or 12. Shepard and Mitchell will set up a remote-controlled, nuclear-powered scientific station there, and they'll walk further from their spacecraft than man ever has before, about a mile, to climb the side of huge cone crater. But getting to that area, with its deep valleys and its high ridges, some up to 8,000 feet, is the greatest challenge ever presented to our space flyers. Veteran former astronaut Walter Shira is with me again for this Apollo flight, I'm happy to say. And Wally, how rough from a pilot standpoint is this landing likely to be? Well, Walter, this is what it's all about, I think. We have uh, a proven guidance system. You recall uh, Apollo 11 and 12 landed on relatively flat, smooth terrain, and now they're going to have to come through some rather rugged terrain to get to this early soil that was ejected from this crater. So you can imagine that everything must be right on in this sense with the computers, uh, right on with the guidance, and the pilot task will be a little bit more difficult, I'm sure. Well, this flight essentially is the same one planned for the ill-fated Apollo 13, dangerous as it is. A four-day flight to the moon, a landing there next Friday morning, two spacewalks Friday and Saturday with, we hope, uh, live color television pictures from the moon for the first time, blast off from the lunar surface on Saturday afternoon and splash down in the South Central Pacific three days later. That would be Tuesday, February the 9th. And as of this hour at Cape Kennedy, Everything's go for Sunday afternoon's departure from Earth. Roger. CBS will broadcast a special preview report on Apollo 14 later tonight over many of these stations, and live color coverage of Sunday's launch begins at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. While the countdown at Cape Kennedy proceeds smoothly, there was a mishap today in the space training program. Bruce Morton reports from Houston. Landing real limbs on the moon has always worked. Practicing in pretend ones is dangerous. Neil Armstrong survived one trainer crash, a NASA test pilot a second, and today, in the same lunar landing training vehicle Alan Shepard has been using, there was a third crash. It came abruptly. The vehicle burst into flames. 40-year-old NASA pilot Stuart Present, who is not an astronaut, had time to eject and parachuted unhurt to Earth. Present was fine, but the $1.9 million trainer is a write-off. The crash leaves NASA with only one model still flying, and it may now have to be grounded. Preliminary indications are the trouble was in the electrical system, which doesn't resemble the one on a real limb. 
so the accident won't delay Apollo 14. But it could delay training for crews on future flights, though NASA says the Apollo 15 schedule probably won't be affected. Now, another look at the crash as pilot present talks to the ground. Land, Uh-oh, I've got a back. Land. We lost him. Go ahead and land, Stu. Right. Emergency in the area. Crew chief flight. Bruce Morton, CBS News, Houston. The space agency has a moon landing trainer for use on Earth by astronauts practicing for landings on the moon. At Ellington Air Force Base near Houston, a pilot named Stuart Present, who is not involved in this weekend's moon flight, was using one and it crashed. He escaped. Astronauts use a bug-like wingless craft to train for landings on the moon. Captain Alan Shepard trained in this one, but it's risky because they're hard to handle. Three out of four of them have crashed and been destroyed. Today at Ellington Air Force Base, test pilot Stuart Present was on a routine check flight when he lost control at an altitude of about 200 feet and was ejected by a rocket, which undoubtedly saved his life. The lunar landing trainer crashed. Its exotic fuel burst into flame. The pilot landed safely several hundred yards away, uninjured. The crash apparently was caused when his electrical power failed. NASA also made a black and white videotape recording of the accident. The wide shot on the left shows altitude. On the right, the ejection when the pilot told the test conductor he had lost control. Land. We lost him. Go ahead and land, Stu. Right. Emergency in the area. Crew chief flight. Land. We lost him. Go ahead and land, Stu. 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 Go ahead and Meanwhile, back at Cape Kennedy, the Apollo 14 rocket sits there on pad 39A, little plumes of steam coming out, all waxed, polished, and greased, and ready to fly to the moon. The countdown so far has been exceptionally smooth and with no serious problems. The beachfront towns that have grown up around the space center have, however, had some problems. A former boom town is no longer booming all that much since the space program was cut back. The cutbacks have been at least partially offset by a Chamber of Commerce campaign to bring in older people. The ads say, come to fresh, friendly, affordable Florida, which means cheap houses. Nevertheless, in Titusville, the town nearest the Cape, one out of every ten homes is vacant. There have been 400 FHA repossessions here. In this part of the world, real estate is important. Right now, we probably have a real estate salesman or someone applying for a salesman's license for every spoonful of sand that we have on Cocoa Beach. The, These are people going to college uh, to learn about real estate, out-of-work engineers, their wives, and men who are worried that they will be out of work tomorrow. And there are all two visible reminders of the boom which used to be. 8,500 people have been laid off here by NASA. The largest office building is 70% vacant. The motels have had an especially hard time. Of all the motels along this gilded strip, only two, operated by national companies, have avoided financial trouble. You can get a drink from an eager bartender down here for 48 cents and the waitresses are courteous and attentive. But 48 cent drinks won't cure the sickness here, the sickness of a town in deep transition. And to top this all off, the Cape, which used to be called Spaceport USA, may soon be known as Jesus Port. The fundamentalist preacher, Carl McIntyre, has bought a $25 million parcel of real estate here, and he's going to set up a combination religious, educational, recreational center. Part of it includes the Hilton Hotel. They are changing the signs now, and some of the locals are already referring to it as the Heavenly Hilton. The liquor bars will be closed, the ashtrays will be taken out of the rooms. The fate of the Gideon Bibles is, as of now, undecided. But it's not the swinging cape of a few years ago. Not at all. An Apollo training vehicle crashed and exploded at Ellington Air Force Base today near the Space Center in Houston after its pilot ejected and parachuted to safety. 
This was the third crash of a lunar landing trainer since the Apollo program started. Details now from ABC's Gregory Jackson. NASA was filming the flight and landing during a check flight of the training vehicle, an odd-looking machine they call the Flying Bedstead. At the controls was Stuart Present, a staff pilot for the Space Center, but not an astronaut. He had made 28 similar landings in the craft, which is designed to duplicate the moon's low gravity. Everything seemed routine, and then, according to preliminary investigation, there was a sudden loss of electrical power. In a moment, you'll see a flash. That's the pilot as he ejects and parachutes to safety. The $2 million flying bedstead plummeted, crashed, burned. A day's end, NASA was left with only one more of these training vehicles. The three others also crashed. But space officials said the mishap would not affect Sunday's moonshot. They said it was also doubtful that it would have any impact on the training for Apollo 15. Gregory Jackson, ABC News, reporting. At Cape Kennedy, space officials reported the countdown for Apollo 14 is continuing smoothly. Astronauts Shepard, Rusa, and Mitchell spent more time in spacecraft simulators rehearsing the nine-day mission that blasts off this Sunday. ABC Science Editor Jules Bergman reports. Almost 10 years ago, America's manned space program began here at Pad 5 with the 15-minute suborbital flight of Alan Shepard. Cramped into the tiny Freedom 7 Mercury capsule, he was hurled 115 miles up by the Redstone rocket, so small it now looks like a toy model. The Saturn V, 100 times as powerful, far more dangerous, yet far safer. None has ever failed. Now, successful launchings are almost taken for granted. For the last three weeks, the Apollo 14 crew has lived in isolation here, breathing specially filtered air, shielded from outside contacts for the first time in an all-out drive to prevent disease from disrupting their flight. The space agency is not about to go through another Apollo 13 episode when the threat of measles forced a last-minute change of command module pilots. The real danger in Apollo 14 is the landing at Frau Marl, a rocky, hilly area of ridges and valleys Shepard and his co-pilot, Ed Mitchell, have to make a pinpoint landing after steering their lunar module, called Antares, over ridges several hundred feet high. They have 15 seconds more fuel than past flights, but far more danger with it. After landing, two moonwalks, lasting up to five hours each, deploying a scientific package with seismographs and other instruments, using a lunar rickshaw to cart their tools, instruments, and samples to and from the LEM. No flight has been more ambitious or tougher, and the space agency is running scared. Should Apollo 14 fail in the aftermath of the recent Apollo 13 near disaster, it just might mean the end of the entire Apollo lunar landing program. This is Jules Bergman, ABC News, at Cape Kennedy.